So my name is Horace, and I'm here to talk about, I'm on the PyTorch compiler team, and I'm here to talk about dynamic shape support in PyTorch 2.0. So what is the problem we're trying to support here with dynamic shapes? So what we're trying to do is we have a neural network, and we want to pass it inputs with different shapes. In addition, we want this to be fast. So one natural question might be, uh, you know, why am I up here talking about this if this already works? Like, if you take a PyTorch program and you pass in tensors with different shapes, this already works fine, and I'm sure many of you have already utilized this feature. Unfortunately, with compilation, as you know, previous speakers have mentioned, things become quite a bit uh, trickier. <laughs> and to understand why, um, we can let's take a look at like the execution flow uh, between Eager Mode and PyTorch 2.0. So in Eager Mode, when you uh, what we do is when you like get in a tensor is we go through the Python code, then we go through the PyTorch C++ code, and then we go through the kernels. And then when you get another input, you go through the Python code again, and then the PyTorch C++ code again, and then the kernels again. Um, on the other hand, with compilation, uh, this workflow, uh, this execution flow becomes quite different. So upon the first uh, input coming in, uh, we capture uh, all of this like logic, and we create like a compiled graph uh, out of it. Then the next input that we get, we need to look up this uh, graph. Uh, and if it's in the cache, then we can just jump directly to the compiled graph uh, without needing to go through all of these steps uh, again. And so notably, this like, reuse of the graph and the static uh, like, uh, representation is what enables us to do these optimizations and gain the performance. However, it also introduces a new challenge which is that all of these components, the Python code, the C++ code, and the kernels, can all depend upon the shapes. And so um, in eager mode, this isn't a problem because you're re-going through this entire thing each time. But in compilation, uh, this is a problem. So a compiled graph needs to be able to uh, support different shapes. And in the case that it like, encounters a shape that it does not support appropriately, we need to be able to know about this, and we need to know that we need to recompile, and this graph is no longer valid. So uh, there are two main ways, or like two main uh, things that we need to do in order to uh, support symbolic shapes, or like it, that uh, our programs can depend upon uh, the shape values. And one of them uh, is if you just directly use the shape values uh, in your program in some manner. And so this is totally fine in static shape world, because when you look at a shape, you know, it's just an integer, uh, and you know, it's totally fine because the shapes are all static, and you can just rely on this being a constant. However, in dynamic shapes, these are no longer constants, and so we need to be able to treat these as uh, symbolic values. Um, and so this is actually <laughs> uh, quite tricky. So as you can imagine, because you know, we have a lot of C++ code, and in, in C++ code, we have integers everywhere, and now these are no longer just integers, they need to be <laughs> like symbolic values, uh, and we need to do this across our entire uh, system. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so this required a lot of work. Um, but as a result of all this work, uh, with symbolic tensors, you know, we have this cool, exciting new system where if you print out the shape of a symbolic tensor, we can now have a symbolic representation uh, of the shape. So we can take a look at like, uh, what being able to propagate these symbolic shapes through our entire system gives us. So uh, this is a IR for Resin 18. And so if you take a look at the metadata there, um, we can see that uh, it's a float 16 tensor with four dimensions. And so the first dimension is like S0, this like a varying batch dimension. The second dimension is 64. As for Resin 18, the channels need to be static. And then the last two dimensions are pretty interesting in that they are, the shape of them are the input shapes uh, downscaled by four. And so you can see that like, the last one is kind of a like, non-trivial uh, representation of shapes. And so this is all enabled by rep representing our shapes in SymPy, which is like a commonly uh, standardly used um, symbol manipulation library. So the other issue uh, that we need to, like, the other way they can rely on shapes other than directly is basically indirectly through control flow. And so there are two kind of main observations that motivate our design. So the first one is that Control flow actually is like a very useful source of information about the shapes in our program. So for example, if you, you know, do an operation between two uh, tensors, uh, oftentimes the shapes need to be identical. And so this provides us information that allows us to like, simplify uh, our shape expressions. Uh, the second uh, useful 
like the second observation that we had is that it's actually like fairly rare to actually like branch extensively upon control flow in your system, um, especially like you know many times uh, uh, through the course of your execution. And so this motivates our system, uh, which we call like specializing and guarding. And so what we do in this like you know sample program is that when we encounter this control flow that you know shape zero is more than five, uh, we peek at the underlying shape. Uh, we see that you know we go down the first branch, which is that the shape is more than five. Uh, and then we like guard on this uh, the branch that we went down symbolically. So you can see in the bottom we have just like a graph that just has a multiply in it without any control flow, um, and as well as kind of like a precondition on what uh, cases need to be required uh, for this graph to be correct. And so note that because we've propagated shapes through our program, uh, these guards are all um, like evaluatable without needing to rerun our graph. And so when we see a new tensor. Uh, whose shape is less than or equal to five, uh, we know that this graph is no longer correct and that we need to retrace and recompile. So although like specializing and guarding is like a very useful technique, uh, there are many other tools in the toolbox, uh, particularly for the export path that Michael mentioned earlier. So for example, if you really want uh, all of this in a single graph and you don't want to specialize it, uh, we'll provide control flow ops where you can manually um, you know, ensure that you have both of these components in a single graph. So those are like the main components of our symbolic shape system. And one of the things that has, I think historically made dynamic shapes so difficult for like a compiler to get working is that you really need this to work across all layers of your stack, right? So if your compiler supports dynamic shapes, but then your compiler front or like your front end does not support dynamic shapes, you end up with a system that doesn't support uh, dynamic shapes. And so when we were looking at supporting dynamic shapes with Pytorch 2.0, we knew we couldn't really do it in a half-baked uh, manner. And so implementing the system required a lot of investment across many layers of our stack uh, in order to ensure that like, symbolic shapes worked all the way through. But as a result uh, of you know, all this work, uh, we now have a system that, one, allows Torch and Darter to generate efficient code for different shapes without needing to recompile. Uh, two, it's built for both the JIT and the export style use cases and is integrated into the PyTorch 2.0 export path. And three, this is all enabled by like deep integration into the core components of PyTorch. So, you know, talking about how cool our system is one thing, but it's you know good to actually look at some numbers, uh, uh, you know, to demonstrate what we can do. And so, one disclaimer I'll add is uh, that dynamic shapes are still under active development, and so these results were obtained on a, a feature development branch and not a master. But we expect that all of these uh, will be in uh, master by the release. So if you take a look, at, so like a common, very common use case for dynamic shapes is for language models uh, with like varying sequence length, especially for like autoregressive generation. And so in this case, if you take a look at the orange line, uh, which is PyTorch Eager, you can see that uh, you know it grows smoothly with the sequence length. It doesn't need to recompile. And so you know this is kind of the experience that you guys get today. And so one way to deal with um, like varying shapes, uh, if you only support like a static shape compiler, uh, a common technique is to like pad to the nearest power of two, uh, and then you know pass that through your program. And so you can see like what the performance looks like there with the purple line, where you can see that you have these like jumps, <laughs> uh, where like you need to pad up to the nearest power of two. And so although this improves performance in many cases, you can see that we're still leaving a lot of performance on the table uh, due to the extra overhead introduced by these computations. On the other hand, with PyTorch 2.0, with dynamic shapes, uh, the pink line, you can see that we uh, not only generally outperform like both static shapes plus padding, as well as eager mode by a pretty significant margin. Uh, we're also able to you know, kind of have this like, smooth performance curve uh, as we increase the sequence length, uh, which is kind of what you get from uh, eager mode as well. Another nice thing about supporting dynamic shapes um, is for reducing compilation time. So, uh, like, although, you know, we do this, like, a pad to the nearest power of two to minimize our compiles, we still need to uh, compile, like, about five or six times uh, for static shapes in this example. On the other hand, dynamic shapes only needs to compile once, uh, resulting in significantly reduced uh, compilation time when needing to support these kinds of dynamic shapes. So although I spent most of uh, our time today talking about, uh, you know, compilation with dynamic shapes, uh, the system that we've built is not really only for compilation. 
uh, really what I view what we build as is a system for symbolically reasoning about shapes uh, in PyTorch. And so, you know, this enables, you know, potentially new future things that we can do. So, for example, one thing that you might, be, that you might build with the system is you might want to symbolically shape check your function. So you might want to, you know, add some annotations to your function, and then we can symbolically reason about your shapes and tell you that, oh, hey, you know, actually certain inputs, uh, you know, might result in a shape error uh, in your program. And, you know, another thing you might do is you might want to count the flops in your neural network symbolically. So you might want to, you know, get a symbolic representation of how the flops in your, like, you know, transformer network uh, scale with, like, the sequence length or the batch size. So uh, thank you for uh, listening to my talk. Uh, and there, I'd also like to thank many other contributors uh, to the symbolic shape system uh, who kind of uh, brought it to where it is today. So yeah, thank you for your time.